Production of A Good Read on Maine PBS is made possible in part by the Verizon Foundation, supporting literacy programs and partnerships reaching adults and children across America on the web at verizonreads.net. What do you do? I'm a writer. I don't wait for the muse to descend. I mean, that, that's, that I don't even know the muse. And so I said, you know what? If I wait, waited for a muse to descend, my electricity would be cut off. Thomas Wolfe says you can't go home again. He meant that thought for the traveler, but it applies to those of us who barely leave the houses where we were born and raised. For the past is lost to us forever. Hi, I'm Sandy Fippen, your host of A Good Read. Kathy Pelletier hasn't lived in Maine for 25 years, but she still can't help writing about us. She also put a fictitious place called Madagash on the map. Surrounded by storytellers while growing up in Allagash on the St. John River, Kathy knew she was a writer when she was still a young grade school student. She's been a prolific writer ever since and now writes under two names, her own and the pen name of K.C. McKinnon. And after she skipped two grades, the sixth grade and her senior year in high school, writing came in handy. I had already started writing. I had already started writing. I even remember the first time I decided I have to put this on paper. It was snowing, and I was standing by the register at school. It was clanking away, and the mittens were drying. And it started to snow. And I remember just being overwhelmed with a f this feeling, this sensation. It's, uh, it's like a baptism, I think, when I hear people talking about baptism, this coming into your, into your body. Um, or, or an epiphany or something An epiphany, like that. Yes. yeah, yeah. I wrote a poem about the snow coming down. And shortly thereafter, Kennedy was assassinated. And I took to pen full time then because I thought, someone has got to write about this woman crawling on the back of the trunk. She was my, my hero and John John saluting, and so I, I kept books. Uh, my father at that time started working for Fraser Paper Company, and they uh, gave him a huge roll of paper. It was about this high. It was like a monster, this big white snowball of paper, and I would unroll it, as we all did, as we needed it, and we'd cut our own paper. Mm -hmm. So I made my, my books out of those, and I... I recorded the whole Kennedy saga. Do those still exist? No. Those books? Oh, <laughs> no. And, oh, oh I, wish, I wish they did. So the seeds were there. And when I jumped that grade, it was a, a, a social, a, a, you know, a, a, an abrupt thing in my childhood. Nobody knew back then how to talk to a child about readjusting to another grade. I went from baseball and recess and no homework to a class where girls were wearing bras and straight skirts and mm -hmm. putting on makeup and doing homework. And doing and homework. Um, it was a very traumatic jump. And there were some ladies in town not happy about it. Hi, ladies. <laughs> and uh, so I, I think that, you, you know how we've heard so many times that writers have to have a sense of isolation. You can have all kinds of um, uh, variables there, but one thing that seems constant mm -hmm. is a sense of isolation. And it can be in a crowded family, it can be, but you have a sense. And I think that's where mine fully developed when I suddenly felt cut apart. Didn't you feel um, different, though, even earlier, maybe? A little bit different? Well, I... Be I th being the baby in the family? No. Uh, I, I think so, but not really. Mm -hmm. Not okay. really. I mean, I knew that I wanted to write, but I don't know if I would have followed through with it. Well, let's piece this together. You went to school right here in Allagash? Yeah, I did. Grammar school, first of grammar all? Grammar school, and I went three years of high school, and then I skipped my last year of high school as well. Okay. I went to Orno to summer school, and... Um, a couple of the uh, professors there said, maybe you shouldn't go back to high school. Maybe you should go on to college. Mm -hmm. And nobody was doing that back then. Right. And so they had to write letters of recommendation, and I had to be approved. And they decided that that was really, I, I, you know, by that time, I was ready to skip. <laughs> the so you the die were, had been cast. So you were very young when you went to college then. I was 16. At college. It started yeah. at Fort Camp. Yeah. I expelled when I just turned 17. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't rest on my laurels long. <laughs> yes. I, I was given their Distinguished Alumni Award after, um, in 1991, and it became an AP story, the idea that I'd been expelled and then was given the Distinguished Alumni Award. Let's go back to your radicalism again. Cause it, was, it, was this because you were protesting? You know, civil rights was on Vietnam? Doesn't it, it sound like it's Angela Davis, yeah. Abby Hoffman's mm -hmm. stuff? Mm -hmm. um, no. I... Uh, 
I, I wasn't good at following rules in the dormitory. Okay, all right. And, oh, yes, um, that was a big one then. That was a big one then. And, of course, we had curfews, mm -hmm. 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And males and females were very yeah. separated. Yeah. yeah, and a group of girls decided to pull a fire alarm one night. And my being the youngest and wanting to be the, uh, you know, wanting the, the attention, my hand was the one that pulled the fire alarm. That got me completely out of the dorm, that one. Um, and then there was a little bit of campus unrest when they wanted to close Fort Kent down to a... Oh, yes. To a, That's right. Uh, I, th I can't remember. It was a two-year program they wanted mm, to... Something, something like something that. Like that. And something I, like that. And we went and met with the chancellor above the president's uh, authority in Fort Kent. So that was quite radical, I think. Yeah, that was. That's very that radical. Was. Well, let's jump ahead now. So after you graduated from college, how did you get to Nashville? I guess that's why I'm leading up to How did you leave Maine? Oh, my. Let's see. After I was expelled for radicalism, which was <laughs> pretty darn easy in 1970, um, I lit out across country hitchhiking. I hitchhiked through 43 states before I came home. My poor father, when he sees this, I called and said, uh, could you wire me some money? And he said, where are you? And I said, Poplar Bluff. And he said, where is that? And I said, Missouri. Going through Tennessee, I fell in love with, with the, the visual rolling hills, and, and um, so I always knew that I was going to go back one day, and I, I did. I went to learn to write country songs and to go to graduate school at Vanderbilt, and mm -hmm. I lasted a short time at Vanderbilt. I took Anglo-Saxon, which was the most stupid thing I've ever done in my life. But We didn't talk about music, Kathy, because mm -hmm. that's the music city. Did you listen to country and western music when you were a kid here growing up? Well, it might have been called country and western then. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's country and has been since. No, it wasn't, because 1948, it officially became known as just country. Right. But okay. uh, say so when you go to Nashville, you don't say country and western. You're there to pitch a country and western song. You'll be shown <laughs> the leading sign. Um, my father played guitar and harmonica and, and fiddle, and okay. so we'd wake up Sunday mornings hearing him singing, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. so, that, again, that's a part of the storytelling tradition. Those old country songs, very, very uh, strong storytelling songs. So that was, you know, I, I had started writing folk songs, I guess, before that, and traveling. I moved to Canada, and uh, that helped me so much with my writing. I, I think now of, of having read later where Ezra Pound said, without music, the poetry withers and dies. And I think that my attempts of writing songs, and I, you know, I've had a couple cut. David Byrne of the Talking Heads cut one. Um, I think that that just made me listen a little more to the words and, and the, uh, the internal rhymes and the subtlety of, of words. Who are you thinking of when we were making love last night? you still write songs? I, I do. Um, I dabble. I'm not, you know, I have friends who are, who are professional songwriters, and so I, I don't want to diminish what they do. The, what they do is a very difficult job. Uh, but I still am interested in ideas that I know don't belong in prose. And uh, so... And plus you're in Nashville. I'm in Nashville, and I have a lot of friends who are songwriters. Mm -hmm. So I keep thinking that one day I'm going to go back and really study the art of songwriting, which I've not really done. I've written a couple hundred songs, but I'm not, I'm not as crafted as those guys. I mean, they can craft a song, and academics can say what they like about it. I'd much rather reach a whole lot of people than a few academics. And they're very good at what they do. I mean, there are bad songs. There's bad opera. There's there there you know there's bad anything. Achy breaky heart. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but I that's not the only music I listen to. But so how did you meet Jim Glazier? Oh, Glazier. 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 When I hitchhiked, I spent three months in Portland, Oregon, or a month in Portland, Oregon before I came back. And I used to go to this place across the street from a piano bar, mm -hmm. and never thought anything more of that. And when I got back to Fort Kent. The woman who used to play piano at that piano bar in Portland, Oregon, moved to Fort Kent to teach music. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that is amazing. Yes. After we became friends and got to talking, that's how we realized. And she had uh, grown up on the farm next to the Glazer Brothers. And, you know, Tom Paul was one of the outlaws with Waylon and Willie. Where does it go? The good Lord only knows. Seems like it was just the other day. And um, Jim Glazer had written Woman, Woman by Gary Puckett and all this, mm -hmm. and had his own hits. And the Glazers had, 
They had won so many awards as a group before Alabama and Oak Ridge Boys that Billboard gave them an award for winning the most awards. <laughs> oh, that's great. That was another award. <laughs> We're so award crazy. <laughs> yes. That's great. Yeah, and the Glazers had published Gentle on My Mind. They had one of the hottest studios in Nashville. What an experience for a young writer because I suddenly started flying around the world with drivers taking us everywhere. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing. I, you can't have an education like that. No. To be called and say, you want to go to Vienna. Somebody's canceled. We're going in, you know, tomorrow. Can, can you be packed? Was it, was or it, we're going to the United Kingdom for five weeks with the driver. I mean, that happened yes. often. So, so you met him and you stayed there. Sixteen and a half years. Mm -hmm. Well, we separated two or three times. I used to call us the Zelda and F. Scott of Music City. <laughs> Um, you have a reputation for being wild there with Jim? Well, we, we were both very stubborn, very, uh, very forceful personalities, and uh, that's probably why we stayed together 16 and a half years, trying to break the other spirit, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, then we really did separate, and we've remained very close friends. Jim came up here in May to sing at my mother's funeral because she asked him to sing two hymns, and so he mm -hmm. took his guitar and got on a plane in Nashville and came, came up and sang the two hymns and went back the next day. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, that's a great yeah. story. Great He's a, cl a close friend of everyone in the family. So How come you never married, though, you two? I never wanted to get married. There were a couple of times when I thought about it, because it, when somebody gets to be, you know, Jim was uh, 15 years older than I. After a while, when you keep saying, my boyfriend, and he's like, you know, 55, <laughs> it sounds like your parents are waiting for you to come home from a date. Um, there were a couple of times we thought, well, maybe we ought to get married. And it just didn't happen. And I never really wanted to get married. I, I just didn't want to do it. Didn't want to put my name on a piece of paper. Uh -huh. And ended up turning 40 and getting married very quickly. Uh -huh. Yes, you did. Yeah. Tell us about Tom. We forgot about Tom. You know, you Who is Tom? Your, <laughs> your husband, whose last My name I husband. can't pronounce. His last name is Viorakic in English, but his father would say Viorakic. Uh, my husband, he's uh, Yugoslavian born when there was a Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. He's actually born in Croatia. His father is Serbian, his mother Croatian. And um, then went to Italy and lived for a while and then came to Canada. Um, Toronto, that's where you met yep. him? He's a Canadian citizen since 72, I think, and so he's, the whole family speaks several languages, and they're traveled everywhere, so they're, they're a very interesting bunch. The b first book was The Funeral Makers, the book mm -hmm. that uh, brought you national attention. Yep. How'd that come about, Kathy, Funeral Makers? What happened? Well, when I was about 16, I wrote a short story called Funeral Makers, and it stayed in my mind, um, the title and um, when I moved to Tennessee, I didn't live in Nashville at first. I lived in Lebanon. Uh -huh. And um, I became friendly with a family of undertakers who owned a recording studio. <laughs> 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 there wasn't one of them playing with a full deck in the entire family. <laughs> and, you know, Southerners can be very eccentric in the most delightful way. And trust me, these people were eccentric. <laughs> I mean, um, and so I used to hang out at the funeral parlor and the embalming room and all through there. And... Uh, that gave me the idea for a family of, I thought, oh gosh, what about that story? So it's not, it has nothing to do with them. The only thing that I ever used that the, uh, the head undertaker told me <laughs> <laughs> was that his mentor taught him a very grave lesson about undertaking. He said, son, you never bring him in at the toe <laughs> because that way all they see of their loved one is two nostrils. <laughs> bring him in at the head. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I thought, uh, I might have to write a book so I can use that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I heard Spike Lee say something. I never thought I'd ever remember something Spike Lee says. He <laughs> seems like a very angry man. But he said about the filmmakers who like to brag that they didn't know anything about filmmaking when they made their first film, mm -hmm. that that will probably work for a while, but eventually it's not going to work anymore. Right. You need to that's start right. studying your craft. And I think that's true of writing. I didn't know much at all about writing. I would have rewritten The Funeral Makers ten mm -hmm. more times. Mm -hmm. The way I write now, mm -hmm. I'm very conscientious about draft. By the time a draft is ready to go out, I've rewritten it maybe ten times or more. Right. Uh, I'll, it's hard to tell. I rewrite a lot. But now, then I went back and said, you know what, I want to learn more about writing. I've written two or three books kind of by the seat of my pants. Mm -hmm. I want to learn more. And so I, I started reading more. This was after the trilogy? Wouldn't you call it the trilogy, the first three books? Yeah, well, you know, Up Updike, I think it was, said we never write four books because no one knows what to call it. <laughs> I think it's a tetralogy, isn't <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah, something um, like that. Yeah. Um, 
it was around that time. But by the time I got to The Weight of Winter, it was actually my fourth book. Mm -hmm. And I spend a lot of time on Weight of Winter. Right, yes, It came do. out as my third book. It, it was actually my fourth. Yeah, it's your third novel. It, it was published third, but it was mm -hmm. the fourth book. I wrote Bubble Reputation oh, before you did. that. I oh, did. I did. I wrote it as my second novel, and it was 800 of the most self-indulgent pages you will ever, ever see in your life. <laughs> I thought, well, The Funeral Makers was front page New York Times book review. People Magazine did a story on me. I was going everywhere mm -hmm. in the country. I, I um, New Yorker. I mean, I mm -hmm. thought, boy, mm -hmm. this is, I'm I'll just do this every time I write a book, yeah. is what I was thinking. Yeah, and, you thought uh, it was easy, didn't yeah. you? Yeah, and I easy. thought, you know, my laundry list must be interesting to these people. I'll just whip <laughs> something up and send it out. And I, if a cat went by and touched my leg, it was like Virginia Woolf. I typed it in. Um, I spent a long time t talking about why cats do the figure eights and the mm -hmm. caudal glands and, and why they're marking and their scent. And anything and everything I knew I put in the 800 pages, which is sad. Some people know more than that. And my agent read it and said, if, you, if anyone does publish this, the critics will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to put it on the shelf and write another book, and that was very, very difficult. I think that's where most writers, many writers, who do one book fall by the wayside. It's the second book syndrome. And mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, so I, I'm glad that I hung in there. Mm -hmm. And when I wrote Weight of Winter, I went back and took Bubble Reputation out, and I cut 400 pages out of it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I try to tell students when I would you know, remind them, you might be in love with your you're writing, but trust me, right. you, you've got to learn to edit yourself. As Larry Monahan scooped by with the town plow, snow was beating against the windows of the McKinnon homestead and spiraling down beneath the yard light. He didn't hear the coyotes as they rattled off a few yowls from the back field edging the woods. And he didn't hear the steady, calm breathing coming from the bedrooms of the old homestead. His mind was on other things as he listened to the scraping blade of the plow. It looked to him like he was going to have one hell of a busy winter. As he rounded the most treacherous bend in the Madagash Road, the lights of the plow swept across the yard of the McKinnon house, proud old house clinging for dear life to the banks of a proud old river. In the swirl of white snow, only the shutters stood out, black eyes open to the blustery night. Larry Monahan didn't know that just moments before, a light had been burning in one of the upstairs windows the heart of the house glowing. Then the old homestead disappeared into the raging blackness behind him. Did you plan on being away from Maine for 30 years? No, no. I, I, isn't it funny? Yeah. Where, where did 30 years go? How mm -hmm. does that, I still feel 18. Right. How did that happen? It goes fast. Yeah, it does. But, uh, you know, I, I, other people, I think, you know how in small towns, especially rural areas, you're always told, oh, you've got to go out to the city and make something of yourself. You've right. got to go out and do mm -hmm. something with your life. Mm -hmm. Well, why can't people stay on their soil of their ancestors and live their lives right there and be as long as they do not ever feel trapped? Right. That's, That's right. the only difference. Right. Then never leave home. Well, stay. I think, I think the ones, don't you, and as, as a quick answer, the people who find love, find their life's mate early on, they seem to be pretty happy. People like that raising their families. You could be miserable and trapped. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you could. But I'm, I'm trying to think if they have a good job. I'm not going to go this far, Sandy. <laughs> I, I know too many unhappy people. All right. Um, let's, let's go to your new books because you've changed your way of writing. You started calling yourself K.C. McKinnon. You have well, I did for those books. Why? Yeah. What, why did you do that? Uh, I, you know, my husband and I were in a bookstore on the waterfront in Toronto near where we lived. And I was complaining about the bestsellers mm -hmm. and moving writer, novelist mm -hmm. friends up into the racks of the bestsellers. Th right. th this is what I do at airports. I put my writer <laughs> friends in Oprah's book club right. thing. I, right. <laughs> um, little boost. And Oprah can't read everybody is my feeling. And I'm like an unpaid assistant by putting some books in there that I think she'd like. Um, and he said to me, why are you always complaining? You know, for two years I've heard you and your writer friends complaining about these more commercial books. That are, why don't you do it yourself? Why? And I thought, what a great question. Uh -huh. There was almost a sense of snobbiness in the idea that, you know, you're not, if, if you write something very accessible, it's not supposed to be good literature or something. Right. And right. Um, I quit buying into that notion a long time ago. So I thought, he's right. Uh, I'm going to try it. And I did. And the first one's in 18 languages. Right. That was the <laughs> Dancing at the Harvest Moon. Yep. And then you followed it with Candles on Bay Street. 
Yep. Which I just finished reading, which is about mm -hmm. Fort Kent. It is. And I want to talk about that if we can a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got another one coming out soon, another Casey McKinnon book, the one about Nashville. Yeah, that one is still, it's, it's just finished, so it's is going out Camilla? to be sold. Is Visiting called? Camilla. Visiting mm -hmm. Camilla, that's yeah. what it's called. But it won't be a year and a half, so watch, I'll start getting emails about where, where is the Camilla book. Right, and the, the, but you also have a Kathy Pelletier book coming out. I just finished it. And that's yeah. called what? What's that called? Running the Bulls. Oh, yes, I did know that. That's right. And that is set where? It's set in Maine, but it's... Um, not Madagash. No, and no. it's... The geography is not important at all. Okay, all right. To the to, to the characters, which the Madagash books are. What's the genesis of one of your books? You get an idea. You know, what what happens? Like with that book, what what caused you to write it? Well, I wanted to write um, another McKinnon book since the first one was selling so well, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, it was it, it was just like a fire. Mm -hmm. It was amazing, and. Um, what do you do? I, yeah, I'm a writer. I don't wait for the muse to descend. I mean, that, that's, I don't even know the muse. You don't you know, know what's going to happen, no. Yeah, I mean, that's part of your job. Mm -hmm. So you, sometimes I have a bit of an idea. Usually if I'm six chapters in or so, then I start making notes on the end. Mm -hmm. Beaming Sunny Home, I wrote the, the ending uh -huh, and thought, first. oh, God, I'm going to have to write a novel up to this <laughs> to ending. To go with the Cause, ending. Yeah, because I, I really wanted to write a short story. So they're all different. But, you know, it's funny when you go to talk to different students. I had a professor once. Uh, say, tell them about the muse descending and uh -huh, how this is part uh -huh. of it. And I was stunned. <laughs> you know, and not only that, students nowadays, they want the muse to bungee jump. Oh, yes. I mean, the, the descending right. is not... Well, it takes too long. Yeah, and so I said, you know what? If I wait, waited for a muse to descend, my electricity would be cut off. Mm -hmm. So that's the job of writing. You said you were a hermit now? I, mean, you I am. How, what do you mean by being a hermit? I'm obsessed with my writing, and I spend... Um, anywhere from 8 to 16 hours a day at my computer to the point where uh, my legs were hurting so much mm -hmm. and swelling and um, my friend Rose Kingsland who's a writer in London, England, we email back and forth, we have our legs propped up and we're both like these two hideously deformed crones <laughs> who are still typing. Um, and so as a result, it, it, you know, I used to hate writing. I still hate writing. I hate it with a passion. I like that I have written something mm -hmm. when it's done. I feel I've accomplished something, but it's still just a, an awful mm -hmm. job. I know what you mean. You, you have to write, though. Well, yeah. I, what am I going to do now? You, well, I mean, I, mean you I, have I to didn't do something creative. take home ec. <laughs> um, I don't know that that's true. You know, I, I guess it's true. I, I think I could spend most of my life looking at the clouds and sipping red wine. I think that's creative. <laughs> um, but I, have, I, I make a living. And I do make a living as a writer and have for quite a while. And you enjoy the career, and you're enjoying your career. Well, I, I suppose. <laughs> you have now your own publishing company? I started a small press. Um, but yet you made a million dollars on the paperback of Casey McKinnon, the first Casey McKinnon book. I don't know how much money the first one made. Mm. It made uh, a lot of money. Right. I was paid a million dollar advance for the second one, mm -hmm. Candles oh, on Bay Street. Oh, the second one, okay. And um, for an 80-page synopsis. Okay. And you're now into film work. I am. I, I'm a, now that is what I'm really enjoying writing. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard plus. work. It's it's again those hours that I have to make myself. You asked am I a hermit? I was telling you um, earlier that one last year I didn't leave my house for three months, and then I had to go to the airport, and then I didn't leave again for two months. <laughs> I go to the back patio with the dogs. Um, I have a little bar at home, and so friends come about every two weeks. A few friends will come, and so I see people. But I really don't get out of my old ratty pajamas and a ponytail, and, and I really am quite... And when you do go out in an automobile, you go, whoa, whoa, <laughs> it, it's, it's amazing. You're moving. It's amazing. And then you go into a supermarket, and you go, God, look at the colors. Look at the things. You know, so it's discovering things anew. Mm -hmm. Now, didn't you, Kathy, tell me before, weren't you working with Hollywood? Didn't Hollywood pick up some of your early books to make into films? Yeah, well, one of them has already been filmed. Uh, the, the first Casey McKinnon book, uh, okay. Columbia TriStar bought it. CBS is going to run it later this year, starring Jacqueline Bissett and Valerie Harper as mm -hmm. the two main mm -hmm. characters. I just optioned the second McKinnon book last week to mm -hmm. a young progressive producer in Los Angeles who's loved it since the manuscript. Um, and then I'm writing, I'm working with a few directors and small independent things mm -hmm. that I've written. That's mm -hmm. fun. I'm just going with a new film agent to see about selling a bigger budget things that I'm writing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a, br I've written seven Pelletier novels, three McKinnon novels, two uh, of the books based on country music. I think it's time to try something new. That's right.
Thank you. My pleasure. From our spot there on the hilltop, we could see all of Fort Kent unrolled before us like a thick, warm rug, smoke rising from fireplace chimneys, yellow lights blinking on as though there were stars being born, little supernovas. Thomas Wolfe says you can't go home again. He meant that thought for the traveler, for the seeker who goes off into the world and then comes back to find that the place he left is irrevocably changed. But it applies to those of us who barely leave the houses where we were born and raised. It applies to all of us, for the past is lost to us forever. For more information about a good read, visit our website at www.mpbc.org. You will find transcripts of interviews, biographies of each of the authors, a complete list of their published works. And you can join me on our new online book club to share thoughts about the writers featured on this series. Production of A Good Read on Maine PBS is made possible in part by the Verizon Foundation, supporting literacy programs and partnerships reaching adults and children across America on the web at verizonreads.net. What, uh, what would you like to say, Kathy, to Maine people? You know? Maine people? Yes. That what would Maine people like to hear from me? Probably mm -hmm. nothing. Um, I've never gone anywhere in the world and had someone say to me, where are you from, that I haven't said Maine. I live in Nashville. And I think that's what comes from having roots that go so, so deep, right. eight generations back, five generations back, and on the same, on the same area. And you know, how do you, you can't buy that. No. Can't buy that. And I think there are people, you know, you pay a price for that as well. There's a negative side to that, but I wouldn't give it up.